Now, in a widely viewed video interview last week, and I recommend this to you if you haven't seen it, Evan Thomas, senior Newsweek editor and renowned historian, was talking about President Obama's world role versus President Reagan's world role. And Evan Thomas said this, I'm going to quote, Reagan was all about America, and you talked about it. Obama is, we are above that now. We are not just parochial, we're not just chauvinistic, we're not just provincial. We stand for something. I mean, in a way, Obama is standing above the country and above the world. He is sort of God. Now, we'll come back to the God part in just a minute. I know it's stunning and it's difficult to set it aside, but, but let's look for just a minute at the rest of what Evan Thomas said. He said, President Obama is standing above our country, above the world. He's telling us that the stuff that President Reagan did to defend the country no matter where he went is, according to Evan Thomas, provincial, parochial, and chauvinistic. We're better and more sophisticated than that, he seems to think. Now, if this was just Newsweek making this point, we could all ignore it. But now, listen to this line from President Obama's own speech last week. He said, quote, any world order that elevates one nation or group of people over another will inevitably fail. In other words, if we want to succeed, we have to stop believing and acting as though America is, in fact, the best nation on earth. Compromise is the new currency, including on issues that are critical to our national interest. And President Obama will stand above it all because he represents not just American interests, but global interests. But here's the truth. Effective diplomacy is not about triangulation. The president is not an international arbitrator. The purpose of diplomacy is not to be liked, and the purpose of foreign policy is not to get applause in foreign capitals. The purpose of having a commander-in-chief and of pursuing America's national security policy is to defend America's interests aggressively, effectively, and unapologetically. If the American president doesn't do this, then who will? One man who did do this, as Evan Thomas pointed out, was Ronald Reagan. And I want you to listen to this contrast because it's very interesting. Listen to the language. In 1987, 22 years ago this week, President Reagan went to Berlin and challenged our adversary, the Soviet Union, to take a step that would demonstrate that they were serious about peace. He challenged them to do more than just talk. He stood in front of the Berlin Wall that separated the free world from the communist bloc. And President Reagan said, quote, General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Now, last week in France, President Obama took a different approach. He demanded nothing of our current adversary, Iran. He challenged them to do nothing, saying instead, quote, we are ready for direct negotiations with the Iranians on a whole range of issues without preconditions in an atmosphere of mutual respect. Ronald Reagan demonstrated the power of an American president standing firm for human freedom and liberty and against tyranny. President Obama is pleading with a tyrannical, radical regime that sponsors terror and has killed Americans to please talk to us. He's offering to convey a tremendous benefit to them in exchange for no cost from them. President Reagan knew there was no moral equivalence between America and her adversaries, and he wasn't afraid to say so. And he also knew that negotiating from a position of weakness could never secure America's national interest. After he left the Middle East, President Obama made an emotional and very important visit to the Nazi death camp, Buchenwald. The undeniable lesson of the horrors of any of those death camps is that evil must be recognized and confronted and defeated, that it cannot be compromised with. Today, the gravest threat to the state of Israel, possibly an existential threat, is a nuclear-armed Iran. Yet President Obama seems committed to doing everything possible to compromise with the mullahs who run Iran today. But we have to understand the reality here. Iran will not be disarmed because we talk them out of their weapons or because we repeat the mistakes of the past, apologizing for our support of a coup 50 years ago and failing to hold them to account for their ongoing support of terror. 
They won't be disarmed because we pretend we have mutual interests or because our president finds moral equivalence. Iran will only be disarmed diplomatically if they know we're serious about using military force if the diplomacy fails. And today I fear that few believe that to be the case. The challenges of Iran and the Middle East are just a few of the issues the President and the nation are going to face in the years to come. And it is important for us to acknowledge that when President Obama makes good decisions, he deserves our support. But when he gets it wrong, and when he attempts to rewrite history, then we have an obligation to stand up and say so. Saying so and being heard may seem to pose a challenge, given that Newsweek's view of the divinity of the president is widespread in some corners of the media today. And as conservatives, you will be special targets for criticism. But I know that you're up to the challenge, and the good news is the mainstream media controls a smaller and smaller portion of the information our public consumes. So you have increasing opportunities to get out there and let your voice be heard in the public discourse. So let me leave you with this one admonition, to write, analyze, think, challenge, and speak. When you see something that bothers you or something that inspires you, post about it on a blog. Submit an op-ed to your local paper. Send an email to publications that you like and respect. There are terrific conservative magazines out there like the Weekly Standard and the National Review and the American Spectator, and they're always looking for talented, smart, young contributors. There are thousands of terrific conservative websites and radio shows, so you have many opportunities to fight for what you believe in and make yourself heard. You should challenge your opponents with facts and evidence and truth and clarity. And you'll find, more often than not, that you will prevail. You have an opportunity and an obligation to take a stand in the cause of our nation. At the end of the day, I am really optimistic about how these debates are going to be resolved and about what the future holds for America and for conservatives. America is fundamentally a conservative nation. We know that our greatness has been founded on a strong national defense, limited government, low taxes, the genius and the ingenuity of the private sector, and a strong belief in individual freedom and responsibility. We know that government is more often the problem than the solution. We know that freedom isn't free, that America's armed forces are the best fighting force the world has ever known. And finally, and most importantly, we believe strongly in American exceptionalism. We know that America is the best nation on earth the best that has ever existed. We believe in her goodness, her strength, her hope, and her example for all who seek freedom in every corner of the world. Those are conservative values and those are American values. So thank you very much for the uh, great honor to be here today and I'd be happy to take uh, any questions people might have.